irony. It's precious, really, and it just might be the tie that binds this absurd reality all together. Those with so much talent often squander it, and perhaps they do so because it's from a boredom and ennui that is not the banal sense of the word, but represents more of an existential pain that can never be eradicated. Depression, self-anger, what, whatever, what have you. And so when they say the mighty have fallen, it is possible to reply that there never really was a place from which to fall, for they had always been in a league of their own, separate from the rest. And so today I'm going to talk about Michelangelo Merisi, who is better known as Caravaggio, named from the village of, that he grew up in. And most people agree he's the painter par excellence. That's right, he knocks out even Raphael and Michelangelo and Leonardo. In fact, he may be considered the best painter of all time because from him onwards, art changed. There was a realism that began to flourish, but so did an aesthetic that changed the course of art completely until probably the modernists came along to change all that again. You know, Picasso is considered a modernist, George Brock, modernist, that sort of thing. Just to clue you in on some of the words I'm using. And why you say, oh, it's realism. Well, don't you mean that Leonardo, isn't he realistic? Well, to, to a degree he is, actually. And you can see where Caravaggio might have appropriated a little bit from some of his later work. But his stuff is still ethereal, though. And there's this otherworldliness about Leonardo's paintings. But Caravaggio, he's this realist that brings it almost to caricature. And so his life was tragic. And most of it self-inflicted. But that's because painting seemed to be just an endnote or footnote for him. The powerful were obsessed with his work and would frequently have to bail him out of jail or prison so they could commission something. He was known for murdering people he disagreed with, attacking the waitstaff for not knowing ingredients to dishes, and for most likely known for very scandalous sexual scandals, that is, involving what we today would call minors. But his life is very high, much a hypothesis. We, we don't know everything about him, and a lot of the stuff is pieced together with from hearsay. So take that all with a grain of salt. He grew up most likely on the streets as a boy prostitute and may have learned the art of painting this way because powerful clergy would have had him over for parties, you know, you can fill in the gaps there. Later on, he would have been able to spend time with the staff and servants and artists who frequented these parties after all these powerful cardinals and bishops and what have you, priests and everything, would go to their separate rooms and talk business, basically. All in all, his work is beyond compare. And just to add insult to injury to most artists, you know, it, I mean, it really is. I mean, most people would just say, you know, that's just, you know, I can't compete with that. <laughs> and here's why. Caravaggio never sketched his work. And some of his paintings were done without even any editing or redaction or correction whatsoever. And unlike many artists who worked in a shop and had laborers at their disposal, he worked alone, gathering his models from the streets. A really good example is his very famous painting, The Death of the Virgin, um, who the, the model herself was a drowned woman from the Tiber River in Rome, uh, most likely a prostitute. However, all that being said, he was not well liked by many in his time because he painted in a different way than the mannerism, which was the predominant um, style of painting at the time. And here are all examples 
of mannerist painting elongated necks elongated bodies um, just you know everything just sort of affected you know almost as if you know you're painting this way because you can as opposed to is there a deeper meaning to why you're doing what you're doing and so here you have this man who you know people might say well he's there's nothing deep about him I mean he's always in fights all the time and duels and hangs out with you know ruffians and he gambles and he spends his time mostly in bars or taverns I suppose because we're here we're here we're in Italy gambling and whatnot you know there's nothing special about him there's nothing there's nothing below the surface well you know you'll be wrong wouldn't you so let's get back to you know why he's so special in the words of Gilles Lambert, who wrote uh, the book Caravaggio, A Genius Beyond His Time, quote, Caravaggio th was the apotheosis of what was later called the Baroque, unquote. So the Baroque is an art movement, very much at the center of revolution reactionism. So we're dealing mostly with 17th century here. Um, this was a man of his time, though. Caravaggio is a man of his time, but also much ahead of his time. I know, it's it's a paradox. He was, for all intents and purposes, brought about... He, I mean, I'm sorry, he, for all intents and purposes, brought about possibly the most famous art movement, but also reacted against what would later be its primal forces, excess and ostentation. Things that are the Baroque is known for, he rebelled against. So how can a man have started a movement, but also rebelled against the same movement? Well, like I said, he's a paradox. He's an enigma. <laughs> His work is so beyond realistic at times that it's almost caricature, which I've mentioned before. You might very well think he is my favorite because of the way I'm talking about him. But I don't play favorites, honestly. But he is definitely in the top five along with Diego Velázquez, Spanish Baroque painter. Velázquez is in the top three. <laughs> so that gives you an idea of how much I like Velázquez. Mark Rothko is a postmodernist. And I'm not necessarily into some of his earlier work, but his later work is amazing. And if you ever get to visit Houston, I strongly suggest that you go to the Rothko Chapel and spend at least half an hour quietly just being immersed by these beautiful, beautiful paintings. Uh, next would have to be Elizabeth uh, Vigée Lebrun, or Lebrun, depending upon how you want to pronounce her, her name. And she painted in the 18th century. Um, and, and definitely sort of, a, um, I guess we would call that... A, not Rococo, because it's past Rococo. It's just kind of the Enlightenment pre-Romantic period. <clears throat> but on the cusp of all that, you know, French Revolution stuff. And then finally, John William Waterhouse. Which I have to say, it's more like a guilty pleasure with his stuff. Because most people say, well, you know, he's he had his own little thing. And everybody's in a Waterhouse and, you know, you know what have you. But um, I really like his work. So, um getting back to Caravaggio because I don't want to have too many digressions here right um, let's get back to that reaction that he had you know that in his time the church with the help of the Jesuits was trying to win back ground it had lost thanks to Luther and Calvin and along with everybody else that came after Luther and Calvin who was a part of their stuff you know there's multiple people that carried on their mantle and did similar stuff so I don't want to get into every single you know person you know um but, you know, here are two people that really, you know, challenged the authority of the church, you know. Uh, Luther came up with this whole thing of like, no, you know, you can't just go to heaven with just the grace of God. You know, you have to also have good works, which, you know, makes Lutheranism one of the most fundamental religions um, that gave birth to Protestantism. So most religions that are... Um, that are that are not Catholic, you know, that are, but are Christian, 
have roots in Lutheranism or also have roots in Calvinism. Um, because Calvin not only um, had similar thoughts to what Luther had to say, he also believed in predestination that, you know, there's this elected group of people, you know, who are automatically going to go to heaven despite anything that had happened because they lived their an austere life, you know, and they dedicated themselves to family and to business. Now, that's a very important thing here, to business, not to not to farming or whatever, to business. Okay, so you have this very different mentality, you know. Um, I mean, capitalism basically arose from this, you know, from this time period. Um, you know, if you study, you know, economics and you look back at Calvinism in the Netherlands, you can see the beginnings of what, you know, would be today called the stock market. So there you go. Like I said, grain of salt or take, you know, what you want from this. Okay. So back to that church again. So the church could no longer silence as it had done before because it was very good at silencing okay you know burning people at the stake and whatnot so so it reacted to this austerity and bleakness of the protestants with an antithesis and what was this antithesis well caravaggio fits this role but at the same time he doesn't want to be this way because he doesn't want to be the insider he's the outsider you know i'm not just going to be you know a reactionary for the sake of being a reactionary there has to be something profound and all this and that's Caravaggio for you so beneath that tough and murderous facade he wanted to extract beauty and grace in its most natural of forms and this is why as I mentioned before he would be practically forgotten after his death until the romantics came along in the early 19th century to mid 19th century specifically the French artist Thierry, um, Theodore Géricault uh, who um, actually sketched a lot of Caravaggio's work, specifically, I believe, his in, uh, painting The Entombment of Christ, which he would later on um, use some appropriations, not too many, um, for that, for his famous painting, The Raft of the Medusa. And then after Jericho, he still wasn't, you know, that well-liked or that well-known until the 20th century when uh, he got a proper critical analysis from the famous art historian Roberto Longhi. In this video, I want to delve specifically into Caravaggio's The Calling of St. Matthew, sometimes called The Vocation of St. Matthew, which is an oil on canvas painting located in the Contarelli Chapel of San Luigi de Franceschi. It was commissioned along with The Martyrdom of St. Matthew, seen here, uh, commissioned by a French cardinal who wanted his personal chapel dedicated to his patron saint. Other artists had failed to meet specifications and a price point, but Caravaggio, with the help of his patron Cardinal, uh, Cardinal del Monte, sorry, received the commission and delivered his paintings somewhat late, although not as late as Leonardo and some of his more ludicrous instances. And they still hang there today. So, in situ, right, in their original place. <laughs> he was still quite young, and he revolutionized the medium uh, you could say with this, uh, with these two paintings, possibly in this very instance, with the second one, the vocation of Saint Matthew. Art galleries didn't exist yet, and um, it it was in the churches, in the cathedrals, in the chapels, where you could find high public art, where the everyday people could see art for what it was, and that's really what the churches were. Um, and, and yes, it was all religious art, but, you know, unless it was a private chapel, you know, this was, this was high art, and everything else was just graffiti, <laughs> sadly. So. As such, his work uh, would have been seen by practically everyone at some point, and he chose to do something out of the ordinary. Oil on canvas. Oil on canvas as opposed to fresco which is applied directly to walls. Oil on canvas was something that, you know, the people in the North did. We're Italians, right? <laughs> Aren't we more into frescoes? If it's in a cathedral, it's going to be on the wall. On the church, it's going to be on the wall. It's not going to hang in a, 
you know, in a frame. That's so passe, it's so banal, right? Mundane. But for him, it wasn't. And secondly, his second painting, the vocation, was set in his present-day Italy. So did he cause a stir? A giant one. A giant stir. Christ in a tavern. That's what they all said, right? Well, here's the thing, Buster. <laughs> it wasn't a tavern. It's not a brothel. There are no signs of any of that anywhere. It's an austere room, barely lit, with people of all ages sitting around doing what they're supposed to do, their job. They're tax collectors. That's an excise office. Christ entered a tax collection office to call upon Matthew, the tax collector. So here we have a barely visible Christ. You can barely see that halo, right? All this painting and, and just this beautiful chiaroscuro. Christ is basically in, in the darkness, right? Completely dark. Cut off. And he has this Michelangelo moment with Matthew, akin to the Sistine Chapel. And the rest of the group all have different poses and reactions. People of all ages doing what, they, what they're supposed to do, the day-to-day -day work of the government. And now they're being called on to be what? To be outsiders. Matthew's being called on to be an outsider. Well, wasn't Caravaggio himself an outsider? And isn't the untaxed church the insider? So what is Caravaggio saying? And I leave that up to you, the, the viewer, to, to figure that out for yourself. Because it's subjective. And I could go on and on about how much I adore this style of painting, like the way he paints, you know, the chiaroscuro, the, you know, the details of the hands and the face and the clothes. However, it's, it's the subject matter that gets to me. Because it's about redemption. And I don't mean the religious redemption, okay? Of Christ redeeming you for your sins and all that bullshit. Sorry for all those that I've just offended with what I just said. Because I, I don't mean it offensively towards you and your belief. I just say that, you know, I really don't think of it that way. But I do believe that we can be redeemed. For our, our tragedy, that is. Or what, we, what we've done where we put ourselves what we've become so it doesn't have to you know it doesn't have to um be religious and, and and this painting isn't really that religious okay i mean the halo is barely visible and otherwise it's just a daily scene it's what we call a genre painting which is which at the time was probably one of the lowest forms of painting next to um you know a still life <laughs> but the still life and the genre painting were elevated you know in in the north Right, specifically in the Netherlands. And what's the Netherlands famous for? Protestantism. Oh, Caravaggio, what are you doing now? <laughs> so, um, and here are various examples of genre paintings. Uh, that one is specifically by Velasquez, which I like. Like I said, Velasquez is one of my favorite painters. So Caravaggio has elevated the mundane painting, oil on canvas, meant for homes, and he's put it where? He's put it in the sacred. The profane has now become what's holy. And after looking at this painting for a while, we, like Matthew, have been called upon to admire reaction and revolution for what they truly embody. A return to our simpler selves. A break from our self-involvement. Drop your tedious bullshit, right? And do something truly grand. Rise up from your tragic banality. And renew yourself. Because despite what you think about yourself... And despite the darkest moments that you see yourself in, 
like Matthew at that table, at that bear table, just surrounded by something as stupid as money, really. Something as contrived and derivative as money and collecting taxes. You can do what with yourself now? You can rise above. You can, like I said before, you can rise up from your tragic banality and you can renew yourself. Thank you for watching and catch y'all later. Bye-bye.